somebody comes up behind me and starts doing the Ezekiel speech. People do that to me all the time. You know, mm -hmm. Ezekiel, and I turn around, and it's Marlon Brando. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> Marlon Brando is reciting me. Like, I'm like, <laughs> That's yeah. uh, and awesome. we end up having this conversation. And he gives me a phone number. He says, Yeah, call me. We need to talk. Da, da, da. So immediately, you know, I go back working, and I call that number, and I call a number, and somebody answers the Sun So Chinese restaurant. Oh. <laughs> hey, uh, Mr. Brando there? Oh, yeah, hold on. Hold on. Uh, and then he comes to the phone. Well, next time I called, hilarious. it was Chinese Laundry. And I said, Mr. Brando there. And I realized he just filtered his calls through people by doing it because they would ask, who is it? And I go, Sam Jackson. They go, oh, hold on. And then he comes to the phone. But he actually was reciting me. I could not believe it. I was a big fan of Marlon Brando's. What he used to do, he was always like this, and he'd be, he'd be talking, and then suddenly he'd say the, the poignant bit, and he'd go like that. And he'd just look at you, and he'd go, oh, shit. <laughs> and I remember I, my first movie, I, I, I did a big movie where I had a part with Zulu, and I played a British officer with one of those white helmets, you know. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I had it on, and, and the cameraman kept, kept saying, push it further back, I can't, I can't, the light's not going in. And I said, I'll hold it there and I'll say when the light's going in. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say something, I'd say, and what do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you ever meet um, Brando? Oh, yeah, I did, yeah. I was, like, I was like a young girl with Elvis Presley with Marlon Brando. I was completely mm -hmm. overwhelmed, you know. I, I, I sort of waited my turn to speak and everything. And what was he like? I didn't understand him at all. <laughs> 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 Watching on the waterfront, the wild one. Yeah. A uh, streetcar named Desire. Brando was a big influence. Brando was huge. I was, it was, I was overly obsessed with Brando. Can you explain that When I was in college. Me? Like, because everyone I talked to from that time, Brando is their sort of touchstone. And I want to know what it was that he was doing okay. that was so different. To me? Yeah. He was a poet. He would condense everything into its essence. I think later on he had a beautiful technique where he would talk to you and be talking to you like this and be reading his lines the whole time. But he knew where to place the cue cards so it would have an effect. When I saw Last Tango in Paris, he was giving a speech over his wife, dead wife, and he did that one time and it just floored me. It threw me back against my chair. One simple little essence. And he was reading his lines. No kidding. Yeah, but he knew where to put them. And then The Godfather came out. Right which is just pure poetry on, in an acting scale. And, but he made it, gave it the, the illusion of reality, but better than reality is truth. And he, he would dig and get the truth of the scene. And um, is that teachable, uh, what he was doing? I don't I mean, think did... so. He was his own genius. He, and he was the beginning and end of what he was creating. Um, no one could do it, but they tried, you could see Brando knockoffs. Yeah. When Paul Newman first started. Do you see a lot of Brando? Say, yeah, I mean, well, you know. As an actor. I'd love to hear a little bit about your upcoming project, um, the Brando movie. Is there anything you can tell yeah, me about? Yeah, surely. That? I had, you know, the idea of playing Marlon Brando had kind of stuck with me. I guess people have been saying it since Dead Calm for whatever reason, genetics or otherwise. Great influence, certainly. Uh, always been a fan. You know, and became a bigger fan when I learned of, of his social activism, and um, particular, particularly in uh, his support of the civil rights movement and indigenous rights. The man really, really walked the walk. You know, he put his ass on the front line, dangerously so, when no one else was kind of doing that in his position. Um, I had no idea that that extended to environmental rights, and when I was interested in in this period of his life just because I like that period of his acting, and we're talking about 1969 to like 74, between Godfather and Last Tango, and you know, it was about my age right now. And I was just putting it out in the universe that I wanted to like, you know, maybe it's time to explore this. Bill Fishman, who wrote it and was going to direct it, he said, that, well, I'm, I'm actually making a movie about Brandon. So well, I want to do mine during the uh, period in, in Tahiti, but well, I've, I've, I've written that. Really, how did, what, what are you talking about? So yeah, I've got the script. It's based on a memoir by an architect that Brando employed um, to uh, build an ecological compound uh, 
in 1969 when no one was talking about that. No one was thinking about sustainability. Um, so I, I love this guy and I wanted to celebrate, yes, his complexities and contradictions and neuroses, and, but fundamentally his passion for humanity. He was good at humanity, you know. I'm sure good at family to some degree, but you know, to every degree as everyone tries to be. It was about this, this two-hander that we want to make. So we're producing the film. We're shooting in um, Fiji uh, in the summer and we're casting now actively. And I'm really happy about it. It's called Waltzing with Brando. Brando, I got to meet him and that was pretty great. He was teaching this acting class in LA and I got to kind of sit in on it and he said, you know, if I ever did a movie with you, it'd be really hard because I'd be laughing all the time. <laughs> and then at one point he was teaching the acting class and his, he had this big dog of his who was up there and the dog was licking his Did ass. Did he teach it up at, the, at his house? On no, it was on, at a little kind of a studio on, on somewhere in L.A. And all of a sudden the dog is licking his ass and he went, wouldn't it be great to do that in a movie? <laughs> and I went, maybe. How behavioral is that? That's just so natural. You know, it's just an idea to kind of just let it hang. <laughs> exactly. I went to see him once and when he was he invited me to dinner. And I walk in to his house at the top. I guess he lives next well, to Jack. Yeah, yeah the, the top that was, of that's the odd couple. <laughs> what happened? Marlon, your dog killed my dog. Jack, it's just insane. I don't know what happened. I told Pujo not to go out. It's weird. What are you doing? Oh no, it's weird. Now, Marlon, God, what have you done now? Put him on a leash. I don't like to leash anything, Jack. No, it's crazy. Come on in, we're having hummus. I'm just sitting in a tub of hummus. And meeting Brando, I got to meet him once. And? It was insane. It was wonderful to see him just to go around with this man. And I'm just going, oh, you know, there he is. You're going, I don't know, it's crazy. Do you have any butter? But he was, it's, he's an amazing guy. All of these guys have so much to tell and teach, yeah. and that's, Brando actually put together an acting class and, you know. Oh, and put it on tape. Yeah. Have so, you seen I mean, the I think, did, no. he, didn't he get guys like you to help him? Yeah, people came and showed up, but I was doing is kind of doing what you talked about giving back and you know saying kind of sharing what he knows and it sometimes he'll ramble on and say i don't know what that means <laughs> but he, but he's saying but also but uh, sometimes he just says to me go whoa it is that kind of buddhist yeah. moment it was all of this stuff that they tell you yeah i think you have to get it on tape and it helps to have people just you know being like a catalyst and just letting them go because yeah. they'll tell you stuff and it's all, and then they want to tell you stuff you know yeah. and it's important because it's almost, it's like the verbal record yeah. or visual, verbal and visual both because they light up because you see them talk about it and they just remember it. And yeah. They, yeah. And it's like, oh yeah, baby. To have an audience again. It's even part. an audience or someone, yeah, it's the audience again combined with, yeah, and remembering it again. And it's yeah. a wonderful thing. Were you happy with how The Godfather turned out? How interesting and astute of you to pick that <laughs> because it was trouble at that point a little bit. And uh, I was stuck for a moment. I adore Brando. I wanted him to have a great time. It was a great coup to get him to come on. And uh, I wanted him to enjoy it. And then uh, I said, um, uh, Were you happy with the way The Godfather came out? I don't want to talk about movies. Uh, I don't think they're. Uh, uh. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> this stopped me. <laughs> I said, okay. Wait, Did you like the book, The Godfather? Uh, <laughs> if you have that show, it's on the, uh, on the uh, Hollywood Greats DVD from Amazon. You can have it in two days. Um, Brando is stuck for an answer for a moment, and then he throws that magic grin of his, that million dollar grin which seduced people of all sexes over the years. And uh, my director was so hypnotized by that Brando grin and close-up that he forgot to cut to the next shot for a while. But uh, that, was, that was how that one went. Oh, that is good. It is. You know who drinks that? Who drinks that? Marlon Brando. Not anymore. <laughs> That's, That's where you that. learned how to drink that from Brando? From Marlon Brando, you know, the actor? Yeah, I'm familiar. I'm yeah, familiar. Actor, yeah. I'm familiar, yeah. He was in Superman. Now, yeah, and he's a what, famous... Uh, wh why, why did he recommend that? What was the recommendation behind this cocktail? He just said, well, what are you drinking? And I said, uh, 
a scotch or something. He said, why don't you drink Campari and orange juice? He talks funny. Oh, I know. And did he say uh, why? I, I did. I tasted it. And then he introduced me to a member, <laughs> believe it or not, of the Campari family from Italy. <laughs> he has a connection there. There are two groups of actors. You can divide people into two groups, those who have acted with Brando and those who haven't, I, I right. guess. And every one of them who has has a story about being nervous on the day he first arrived. Yeah. With me, with us, he was very, uh, he seemed to make a big effort to make everybody comfortable. Mm -hmm. I remember he was a little late. We had a rehearsal in a hotel room and he came in and uh, he was about 20 minutes late. And the actors, we were trying to be like, well, you know, the actor who's playing whatever his name, Mr. Sabatini, is mm -hmm. coming in in 20 minutes. You know, we tried not to make any special fuss. Yeah. But as the time grew closer, you know, it was, I think somebody had a harmonica out, you know, and <laughs> I was nervously <laughs> fiddling with dials and a, the radio. I mean, I was, it was, we were more and more hysterical. And he came in and he was, he's a big fella, you mm -hmm. know, and he had on a, a velour sweatsuit. And, uh, what color? I think it was like light blue with, uh, you know, yeah. middle European stripes on it, sort of, and uh, sunglasses. And uh, he looked like Marlon Brando. Yeah. And uh, did the hair on the back of your neck? Move oh a yeah, bit? I was, I was like, <laughs> yeah. and uh, he can do that. Big hug to everybody, yeah. you know, and immediately tried to put us at ease. He had mm -hmm. cowboy boots on. Yeah. Uh, but he was, um, he he sat down and we started to rehearse, and he was just. Uh, like one of the guys, extremely friendly. Who has a way of throwing the fear of God into uh, his yep, colleagues. He does. And um, imagine the fun of having that power and being able to use it for good or ill. Yeah. Uh, I remember even the crew, like, you know, lighting the set, and when finally it was time for him to come out and enter the set, mm -hmm. there was like a, a hush. It's really like royalty is coming, mm -hmm. you know, everybody feels it. Did you find you could learn from working with him in any meaningful sense or shall I withdraw that? Uh, no, I, ho I mean, that's, I would love to learn from him. Uh, I found acting with him the, one of the most pleasurable uh, times I've had acting. Uh, he's so, there's so, there's so much coming, so many rays coming out of him, you know, when you sit opposite him and have a scene with him. Uh, that there's just, you're, yeah. you have plenty to do just to keep up with him and react to what he's doing. There's, there's just, you never have to... As they say, gives you a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's a better way to put it. Uh, so it's just, you, you feel very taken care of, at least I did. And we had scenes that were seven pages long, two, two of them, which is unusual in films, too. But so we would do these eight-minute takes, and... Uh, they were just a total joy. Nervous as you are mm -hmm. to be working with Marlon Brando, once you start, he gives so much that you forget how nervous you are. But this was the moment you, you didn't think he'd show up. No, no, definitely not. Uh, <laughs> I was cast and they said, Marlon Brando's playing the other guy in it. I was like, yeah. And uh, <laughs> they said, no, really. We're gonna go to the island and get him, and he's coming. His island. His island. The island of Dr. We're gonna, we're gonna you know, yeah. put him on a ship, like, <laughs> was it like King Kong, you know? <laughs> yeah. Goldfinger, a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> and they got him stateside, and uh, we were rehearsing. This is the freshman. Yes, yeah, the fresh. freshman, and we were rehearsing in the director's hotel room, and uh, Marlon was supposed to show up. He was a little bit late. I was again like, oh, he's definitely he's not, not gonna show up. <laughs> definitely not coming. A little more time passed, the doorbell rang, we all crowded around the door. <laughs> Director opened it. And uh, Marlon Brando, on his knees, because no. he was sorry he was late. Whoa. And he was only about four hours late. <laughs> 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 and he was wearing a, a tan velour sweatsuit, a cowboy hat, <laughs> and some kind of slightly pink-tinted uh, sunglasses. <laughs> but I feel like I might have imagined that part, but I <laughs> What he was wearing. He was wearing that, I think. And was this the part of his career when he started using the earpiece and all those things? Or... He did. He was using an earpiece, yeah. Which is, which is actually, he was still fantastically good and rehearsed a lot, too. So he worked very hard. But, but he, he rehearsed 
with an earpiece. Sometimes he would rehearse without the earpiece, but then when we were shooting, he would have an earpiece so that the, uh, he could hear his lines being read to him by his secretary. Some... <laughs> he, said, he said, I don't like to do too many takes because I start to learn them and I'd rather not know them. Wow. He felt it was more organic to just have the words appear. Yeah, that's right. So there was a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Between takes, he could still talk to his assistant. Yeah. So he'd, we'd, they'd say cut and he'd say, you have to start speaking before he finishes. <laughs> 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 You hear a pause, you say, are you talking to me, Marlon? You've got a magazine in one hand, <laughs> and you're not paying attention to the scene. <laughs> I'm not paying attention to the scene? <laughs> I, I'm speaking to my assistant. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I take a letter to Nick Mancuso. <laughs> <laughs> the money is right. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>you said the last tango was like a documentary like a jean rouche movie uh, about marlon brando do you remember that scene where schneider's asking him to talk about himself and then brando says things about his childhood and about standing in cow shit and everything and these are things really from brando's life you haven't continued to use that kind of very documentary approach to things, why? Always, it's the only way I can shoot a movie is, uh, as Jean Renoir said, to let the door open and let the unpredictable reality come into the shot, come into the movie. You know, if Marlon would have come with a devastated face because he had a very naughty night, Instead of putting a lot of makeup on his face, I would, I would have managed to use this devastated face because that was in front of the camera and there is no makeup that can hide the truth to the camera because the camera always sees the truth. So that was my deal with Marlon Brando. I didn't want the same Marlon, the fantastic Marlon we have seen in Waterfront of Zapata. Marlon, I want to grab out of your face, take off from your face, the actor studio Stanislavski Strasberg mask. Mm, he never answered yes or no. Then seeing the movie, I thought, I succeeded. I mean, Marlon Brando in Last Tango is much closer to what Marlon is in life. And when two or three years ago, I had a long meeting with Marlon after a long time, and I told him, don't you think that I, I achieved my mission to take off the mask? Marlon said, he had this little smile, and he said, ha ha, do you think that that one was me? Ha <laughs> ha. Um, um, but in fact, it has been always my way of um, approaching a story. To use the camera as if I was doing a documentary. You said cinema verite is very right. 
There was a monologue of Marlon's character in front of the corpse of his dead wife. And it was coming very much from a, a Strindberg text. I never told Marlon, but um, it was from a Strindberg kind of misogynist drive that I took. And Marlon changed it, and it started to come out with this very, very emotional thing. You big fucker, tell me the truth, etc., etc., etc. Marlon doesn't like to learn dialogues by heart. <laughs> the dialogues written just behind the camera. He likes to look for a second, catch a word of the original dialogue, and from that word, reconstruct in his memory what he had to say. And uh, he's there looking at the dead wife, and here there's a huge blackboard with the old dialogues written. It's nice to reveal <laughs> this. You naughty exactly. thing, you should pretend that you memorized it all. Uh, no, because uh, Marlon uh, is famous for that. Sure, I know. I remember he was so happy when Maria Schneider was giving him the line out of the camera, just next to the camera, and uh, Maria would appear in front of him, who was in a close-up, with the, like the dialogue written on her forehead. He would be so happy because we were making fun of him and he has a lot of sense of humor. I tried very hard to put at least my version of Graziano on the screen. They accused me of, of imitating Marlon Brando. Uh, subsequently, I don't know, a year later or so, Rocky and I were sitting around drinking beer together, and um, I mentioned Marlon's name. And he said, oh, that's one of the stories that I forgot to tell you. I kept noticing when I was sparring that there was this kid that was sitting there with a sketch pad and so forth. and he kept watching me for a year, and we chattered this or that. I never knew the kid, never knew what he was doing. Said he was an actor. I thought he was a spear carrier in some Shakespearean production. What do I know? Finally, uh, I didn't see him for a long time, and he came back and said, I'd like you to come and see this production that I'm doing on Broadway. And I said, uh, well, sure, what are you, a musical? What is it, you know? Well, it was Streetcar Named Desire. And what had happened, of course, that Marlon and I had both the same basic character that we were dealing with. He had taken uh, Rocky and put him up on the stage in the streetcar, and I put him up on the screen, and somebody up there likes me. Tell me a Marlon story. Who's got a good Marlon story during the shooting of The Godfather? Oh, my God. Go ahead. The first day we met him, because my, my he, he's my oldest, I, I'm not very proud, but I, I'll tell the whole world, my oldest, uh, dearest acting friend. And he made me moon uh, Brando on, on, on the way home from that lunch. <laughs> made me moon? A car to car. On second on Avenue. Second Avenue. I saw it, actually. <laughs> on Second Avenue. You pulled your pants down on Second Avenue I didn't, in front of Marlon No, no, Brando? in a car. I, Bobby's <laughs> famous for that. I never did it because yeah, so you can hold my ass is so not skinny. existing. It's true. Skinny ass. Yeah. That became the thing. Uh, around the Godfather scene. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was in fashion at that time. I, I think the best story, if you remember, when, when Luca Brasi comes in and says, Don Corio, I am honored I am to honored. be here on the day of your daughter's <laughs> wedding. You have invited me to May your daughter's wedding. And just looked at him and said, what the hell is going on? <laughs> so he grabs me because he was a friend of uh, some friends we had. He says, Jimmy, go do something. What do you mean, do something? He says, Make him do something. Francis, what, what, what do you want me to do? something, and he said to me. So I go to Lenny, who had a tongue the size of a shoebox, okay? <laughs> and I said, Lenny, listen, it's a close up. When they open the door, put a piece of tape on your tongue and say F you, you know, write to F you on a thing. Please, Jimmy, like a kid, please, Jimmy, don't make me do this. I said, no, you got to do it. Finally, I convinced him to do it. He opens the door, everybody laughs. You know, and he goes, Don Corleone. <laughs> <laughs> everybody laughed. 
So Francis says, great, let's go again. Okay, now we're ready to go. We go again. He says, Don Corleone. And Brando had FU2 on his tongue when he said, <laughs> Luca, you know. But we went back and nothing changed. Nothing. Oh. Cleverly, three weeks later, he shot the wedding scene and he put Luca in the corner practicing, <laughs> studying yeah. a speech to make mm -hmm. it all work. I mean, it was a brilliant piece of... See, and then they shot that. And it was like, yes, yeah. please. And he was That's the that. benefit of brilliant. shooting things before that don't necessarily follow, you know, so that you have time to come up with <laughs> yeah, that yeah. stuff. You know, it's, it's traditional. Really. The wedding scene you sticks in my mind here. Even though you were very familiar with Hollywood, young actress, just describe what it's like to be shooting a scene, dancing at what was your wedding with Marlon Brando. I, it, I, 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 I was, I was, I was overwhelmed. I mean, I, I couldn't believe when he came towards. And he's a very handsome man. He wore a lot of makeup to age him, and he would take it off at night, and he was just. You know, quite stunning. But he was anyway, only 39 years old. That's he was. Right. How old is he? He's 39. Was 47. That's he was 47. He says 47. Well, but he's 39. Bobby loses track. But 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 he was. We're gonna look it up. Okay. How old was he? But he whatever he was, he you know he was incredibly handsome. And then he put all, you know, the the stuff in there. But anyway, to to I can't follow. I'm I'm sort of dyslexic, and I I'm dancing with him. And I'm tripping all over. But he was so, so kind to me. He was such a dancing kind man. with Marlon Brando. I know. Uh, yes. And we had a lot of girls downstairs. Oh, 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 oh like I see. That. And I haul off and smack him on the face. Fire! We did a movie together way after I tried to uh, do away with my life. And all of that had to do with my relationship with Marlon Brando. The movie is called The Night of the Following Day. I didn't want to have to slap him in the scene. And he said, you have to do it. He said, you can't fake that. You just have... Rita, you know I'm tough, blah, blah, blah. And he made me rehearse over and over, and he said, yeah, okay, you can do this. So we did it, and I hauled off and slapped him in this scene, and the, which you will see in the documentary. And to my absolute astonishment, he not only slapped me back, he slapped me back so hard. It was, I now understood what it meant when you said I saw stars. I really did. I mean, I just was like this. And that opened up what I call pond scum. I All the stuff that I had never really expressed to him because I, the suicide took, kind of took care of that, you know, unspoken. And I went crazy and I started to attack him and he got so scared. If you watch it, you see him going like this. And I didn't even know what I was saying. I don't know what I was saying, but I was enraged, enraged. Yeah, well, we did a movie. Uh, what was that? Missouri Breaks. Missouri Breaks. Yeah. <laughs> Is that when you became close friends with Marlon Brando? Well, we did a scene together. I was at a scene with him where he kills me with a spike into my eye, <laughs> which he invented. And I remember I tore all of his... He was dressed as a woman. And one of the scenes, I tore all of his clothes off. <laughs> Arthur Penn was the director. They said, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> the wardrobe was out trying to put his clothes back on. He said, well, why, why are you tearing my clothes off? He said, I've got a gun here. I said, yeah, but you weren't looking. <laughs> so we didn't see each other for years. But the last three years of his life, Marlon and I were very close. Huh. We talked on the phone for hours. He taught me Shakespeare, Shakespearean monologues from The Tempest. And uh, Macbeth, well, I'm not supposed to switch in. I was supposed to say the Scottish play. <laughs> and uh, I was very honored and blessed to know Marlon. We spent hours on the phone. Was it hard to get to know, get to know him? No, or was he it hard me, to get past that? Uh, he asked me that once. He said, do you like me because I'm Marlon Brando or because I'm a real person? I said, well, when I was early on, when I was an actor, I liked you because you were Marlon Brando. I said, no, I don't give a fuck. Now, one actor who you didn't get on so well with um, was Marlon Brando. And I was interested that, in fact, you grew your mustache originally so that you would, so people would stop saying that you look like Marlon Brando. <laughs> yes, I, I did. I, I, uh, he had a mustache once. But 
Not as good as yours. I told everybody it didn't look good. <laughs> uh, he was a strange man. He didn't like me at all. And I didn't try to look like him. I didn't try to act like him. I, mean, I thought he was the best actor in the world. When he finally talked to me, which was took forever, I was introduced to him, and he went, um, 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 um. And I said, that was very enlightening. <laughs> You're the finest actor in the world. I mean, I, I'm thrilled to meet you. And I said, I wish I could say the same for you. <laughs> which hurt a little bit. Brando. Whew, man, that's a show all of its own. I have so many, you know, deep feelings about Brando. <clears throat> uh, he's, he's the greatest film actor that I've ever seen, uh, hands down. And I knew that when I was in my teens. So, uh, and uh, between Montgomery Clift and Marlon Brando, uh, they were, uh, they just changed my whole life as an actor. I was an Orson Welles, very dramatic Shakespearean actor. And when I was 13 or 14, I saw in one week, I saw Place in the Sun with Montgomery Clift in it. And I saw, the first time I saw Brando was not his first film, but I saw him in Viva Zapata. Mm -hmm. And those two movies changed my whole way of thinking about film. I had to, I mean, about acting. I had to rethink everything because it was so subtle. They were so beautiful. Was Brando the greatest film actor because of the quality of his talent and technique alone, or is it inseparable from his presence? I think it was both. It was both. But he had great technique. I mean, great, great. He was a great te technician. But also, he had a presence on screen that was just... Uh... No, I th but it was... Well, it's hard to distinguish between his acting and his personality, but he had such magnetism. He had such incredible magnetism. And then personally, just, uh, uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, it was just uh, meeting him was one thing and then working with him on Apocalypse Now, we had a lot of problems together. And uh, uh, he refused to be on the set the same time I was. And uh, Why? Uh, I'd like to think that he was doing me a favor, honestly. I went down to, okay, I went down, first of all, I, to do Apocalypse Now, Fred Roos wanted me to be in it. He had seen tracks that I did with Henry Jaglin and played a soldier coming back from the Vietnam War. I said, well, I'll do this, because I was in France and I was out of work. I said, I'll do this, but I want one line with Brando. I don't care what it is, I just want one line with Brando. So that was relayed to Francis. France said, okay. And so I arrive in the Philippines from France, and, uh, <clears throat> Brando has not arrived. Now, Brando's on a million-dollar contract, and he's going to play a million dollars a week. He's going to do one week, and then he keeps going, whatever. So everybody's waiting for Brando to arrive because Brando has now been ill or something's happening, and everybody's sitting around waiting for Brando to arrive. So I, when Brando finally arrives, I have been down there a month and a half. And I have this crack unit. We're doing drills. We're doing karate, jiu-jitsu. We're climbing trees. We're scouting. We're holding bridges at the Japanese and the right. everybody and the French and the God knows who have lost and gained and so on in real wars. And we're doing really well. We're a crack unit. And <laughs> I got the Ithagao headhunters, and we're going for it. So anyway, so then we go to dinner. And at dinner, I have been given a little red book. This red book is a special services book by the special service, which I'm not really supposed to have, but one of the Green Berets gave it to me. Mm -hmm. And I got it in my boot. So at dinner, Francis has been on him. I don't know this, but Francis has been on him saying, you didn't read the book. You didn't read Heart of Darkness. He's been on Brando all day. He finds out Brando has not read the book because he's not going to have a story conference. We've got to do this picture, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. There's no ending. And I say to Brando, sitting across from him at dinner, I bet you haven't read the book. And he thinks I'm talking about Heart of Darkness, but he, I don't know this at the time. So I'm about ready to pull out the red book, and he gets up and he says, I don't have to listen to this. I don't have to take this. And he's screaming and yelling. Why do I have to hear it from him? I have to hear it from this punk, you know? And he's screaming and yelling at Francis, and he storms out of the house. 
So I take this very personally and I start guess. getting into my cups and like, you know, and doing a few other things that uh, we have plenty of down there. And I, uh, and I, we go into a, a boxing match. They've, they've, uh, some, uh, Bantamweights, uh, Philippine Bantamweights, which are really good. And they're going to put on a fight that night in Brando's mm -hmm. honor. So we go there and I sit behind Brando and I start doing numbers on him at the boxing <laughs> match. And then, then we go to see the Seven Samurai in a movie theater. And I'm sitting then again behind him, and I get up at one point, and I say, there's an actor in here that, like, you know, that said of a dead friend of mine that he wore his last year of Levi's, drove his last year of motorcycle, and, wore his la and did his last year of bongo drums, and I sure would like a piece of his ass. In film, on film, ba 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 and I storm out and stagger into some, like, motorcycle and fall over into some bushes or something, you know. But anyway, the next day, everything shut down, and Brando and Francis go off on, on a two-week river excursion and come back two weeks later with a script. And so Brando said, I work with him, but you do your scenes first, and then I'll come and listen to you, but we'll never be on the set together. It'll be like Island of Dr. Moreau, which is like, you know, that <laughs> it's is... It's hilarious. He is great in that movie, but apparently he had an earpiece in and his assistant was reading his lines Not to just him in that movie, trailer. he had an earpiece in his ear for a number of years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but 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 I well, think for a lot of actors now, that works I think because I think, I think that works for a lot of actors because they just to, they don't want to learn lines, they want to keep it really spontaneous, so I, I get that. I would be a little, I'd be a little bit like, hang on, what? <laughs> keep rolling, hang, hang on. Did you say he, he does that now? Hold on, hold on. So. But apparently he was doing that during... He would do stuff so. like that. that was like, a wonderful... You're reading the wrong scene. It's, the wrong, it's another scene. That's a, that was a wonderful brimstone-ish justification for his behavior. Yeah, that's right. I had an earpiece scene and I was in the wrong movie. Um, but... Apparently, before your question, he, another thing about Dr. Moreau, the, um, the, the little person that he brought on set was his idea. Yeah. He that met him so on the cool. island and was like, you're going to write a part for this guy. We're going to do a piano. It's he pretty much did what he wanted. Yeah. He did. There's a wonderful documentary about the making of Island of Dr. Moreau that's yes. on YouTube that is just... Well, the original director who got kicked off the movie ended up... We'll come back to your question yeah, in a yeah, second, no, sure. guy. No, no. Hang on a second. <laughs> the original director who got kicked off the movie ended up going into the jungle, disappearing into the jungle, and came back as an extra as a, one of the creatures. And he, so he's there, in the, and the, without the producers knowing. So it's, For like it's weeks, a fascinating, too, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Go watch it. It's the best. He was like, he wanted the sunscreen on. That was like all his idea. Yeah, his whole... I think he came out of the dressing room each day going, this is what I'll wear today, and they're going, roll camera. <laughs> 